Welcome everybody to this, the eighth Carbon webinar. When we started the Carbon webinar, we really wanted to fill a gap um, during this pandemic where it's just very hard to communicate the great science that's going on in the carbon material science um, area. And so we wanted to have a, a platform to do that. And in particular, early career researchers have been hit hard by the inability to present the work that they're currently doing and publishing. And so it's, I'm very excited to have this very special session where we're going to have short talks given by early career researchers who have won awards um, for their excellent work in carbon material science. But before introducing them, I just wanted to um, remind us how to interact with the speakers in, in Zoom and how we're going to run this webinar. So we're not gonna run it like normal. We're going to have um, the, four, the four talks that are gonna be pre-recorded and they're gonna play one after another. And then after that, we're gonna have a live Q&A session. So we have all of the speakers who are, who are currently here and they're all going to be there um, to answer any questions you have. Now you can post your questions to, in the chat um, down here, or it's actually up um, in the chat uh, menu. Can you please do that during the, the talks? And then after that, um, we'll, we'll have um, a QA, and a a live q and I should also say that we're recording this. So if you do want to unmute and ask a question, that will be recorded and put online. You can also raise your hand. Now, after this, we're going to have an opportunity for more casual conversations on a platform called GatherTown, but I'll introduce that a little bit more later. So I have the great pleasure of introducing four great speakers for today. Um, the first person is Dr. Pajana Sonia. She's currently at the Czech Academy of Sciences, and she was the winner of the Carbon Journal Thesis Prize in 2020. The second speaker is Dr. Ropian Fung, She's currently at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia, and she was winner of the Carbon Journal Thesis Prize in 2019. Our third speaker is Vladimir Pimanov, and he's currently at the University of Montpellier, and he was awarded the 2021 Young Scientist Award by the French Carbon Society. And the final speaker will be Dr. Manuel Pichot, and he'll be, uh, he's currently at the University of Bordeaux, and he won the 2020 Young Scientist Award um, from the French Carbon Society. So the first two talks will be covering some very interesting work done on batteries. And the second two are gonna really focus on some, some work in, in nanotubes, some of which um, was published just last week. So really um, cutting edge stuff. So uh, just to remind you, we're going to have the four talks, um, we're going to play them and then have live Q&A after all four talks have played. So thank you. Hello everyone, I am Farzana, I am a postdoctoral fellow in Herosky Institute of Physical Chemistry in Czech Republic. I did my PhD from Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay, India. So the part of the work that I will show today is from IIT Bombay and another from Hiroski Institute. So let's begin. We will talk about electrochemical energy storage in graphitic or graphenic carbon. To be more specific, it will be about rechargeable batteries. The commercial rechargeable batteries that we all use in our laptop or um, mobile or in smartwatches, most of them are lithium ion battery that use graphite as an anode material. Let's see why. In simple term, graphite is composed of multiple layers of carbon atoms and in that particular layers, if we see the carbon atoms are arranged in hexagonal fashion. When we see the cross section of graphite, we could see, we can see that there are empty spaces in between these carbon layers, which is called as interlayer spacing. These spaces are capable to store different sizes of cation and anion. This properties of graphite has made it as the commercial material for lithium ion battery. Let's see how lithium is stored in the graphite. When the battery is charged, lithium 
intercalates in between the graphene layers graphite layers and um, the concentration gradually increases because of that we could see a uh, peaks appearing in the cyclic voltammetry or potential plateau in the galvanostatic potential profile this is the final product that can be formed from lithium and graphite when we discharge the battery the lithium comes out from the graphite structure and a reverse peak in the cyclic voltammetry or plateau in galvanostatic potential profile is appeared so the graphite is a very good material for lithium storage it is very stable for multiple number of um, multiple cycles of lithium going in and coming out but the problem with graphite is the capacity is less and also this process of lithium storage in graphite is quite slow so if we want to have a battery which has higher capacity and that can be charged very soon maybe in few minutes we all want to have it right that is a bit difficult with graphite so uh, scientists uh, try to come up with other alternative materials which is capable to do that and carbon scientists tried with reducing the thickness of the graphite to the single or few layers of graphene that is expected to have a higher capacity um, and also the faster charge and charge but when it is checked in the literature we can see that there is a huge range of capacity reported for the graphene materials and also the potential profile is quite different uh, for this graphene from that of the graphite so is the uh, is the lithium storage mechanism is different for graphene than graphite does the lithium uh, don't intercalate in the graphene material we try to understand that and for that we try to see the uh, we could see that the graphene that is used in the literature for this uh, works are mostly reduced graphene oxide which have mostly have more defects more uh, oxygen functional groups so for this cases it is not only about reducing the dimensional scale from graphite to graphene but there are multiple other factors that comes into picture so for the graphite if we have some defect or functional groups on the surfaces it uh, don't have much role in the lithium storage in the bulk but when we talk about graphene then this surface uh, defects or oxygen functional groups have a huge role so we in our work wanted to uh, get rid of those extra factors and we just wanted to see if we want if we reduce the dimensional scale from graphite to graphene how it advantages or disadvantages the lithium intercalation for that we deposited a uh, bulk graphite or nickel foil using uh, electro uh, using chemical vapor deposition method and in the same method we also prepared a defect free well ordered few layers graphene approximately seven layers of it then we tried to uh, and uh, we tried to test it against lithium and we compared its performance with graphite and we could see that the cyclic voltammetry and also the potential profile of galvanostatic charge discharge are quite similar for the few layer graphene and graphite this indicates if our few layer graphene has a very less defect and if it is very well ordered then even for this reduced dimensional scale we could have a classical lithium intercalation similar to that of the graphite but the difference comes when we check the uh, specific capacity the capacity for the fuel layer graphene is 3 to 4 times higher than that of the graphite so there must be some source of extra capacity in uh, storage in this fuel layer graphene we tried to um, search for that we did the analysis of cv and we did dft based calculations which indicated that there can be formation of more than one lithium layer on the surface of uh, graphene and also at the step edges which is kind of a surface control process of lithium absorption and along with there is some lithium intercalation the classical one and which is the diffusion control storage and this phenomenon give rise to the higher capacity in this few layer graphene
we also studied the potassium storage in this well ordered fuel air graphene and we observed a similar potential plateau for fuel air graphene and the graphite so and it is um, the uh, storage mechanism is quite similar with the lithium with a higher capacity for the fuel air graphene when compared with the bulk graphite and we also tested the rate capability for the uh, for the you know, potassium and for the lithium and we have observed that for the potassium the change in rate capability is dramatic when we go from the bulk to the fuel air graphene we lost almost all the capacity it becomes almost zero for graphite when we are at the higher current rate so for the potassium storage specifically going from graphite to graphene is very important we also did dft based calculations on the potassium storage in single layer graphene now if we consider about commercialization of graphene based lithium ion batteries then reduced graphene oxide is a better candidate because they are cost effective and there there is a possibility of mass production of this reduced graphene oxide but this argues um i have more defect and more oxygen functional groups in general that i was mentioning in few uh, slides back but we have seen that if we can optimize the process parameter then even for this reduced graphene oxide it is possible to have less defect and very well ordered um, argues which can give rise to a potential profile very similar to that of the graphite that is that means proper classical intercalation of lithium in the reduced graphene oxide also but still having a higher capacity higher rate capability for this argues till now we talked about the cation intercalation in graphite and graphene but let's talk about anion intercalation also in the graphite anion intercalation in graphite has given rise to different applications including dual ion batteries the name already suggests that this batteries are capable to store more both cation and anion and it is capable to give rise to high working potential and the energy density we studied the perchlorate ion intercalation in graphite in aqueous system aqueous systems are very important to study because they are cost effective they are more safe to use including many more other advantages for this particular studies we have done a systematic um, investigation with different type of graphites um, and tried to correlate their structural properties with this anion intercalation in the aqueous system in conclusion graphite is a very good material for electrochemical energy storage However if we want to have a higher capacity and faster charging discharging possibility then we should go down to the lower dimensional scale of it where the structural and physico chemical properties uh, have a very important role in this work we have unveiled how electrochemical energy storage is dependent on such properties with that i would like to thank my present supervisors my phd supervisors Uh, collaborators lab members funding agencies and the institutes i would also like to thank carbon and elsevier for recognizing my work and australian carbon society for giving me this platform to talk about my research thank you everyone for your kind attention Hi, I'm Robin Fang. I'm from School of Chemical Engineering in UNSW Sydney in Australia. It's my great honor to have this opportunity to give a talk here. And today I would like to talk about our recent work on microscopic and macroscopic coupled electrode architecture for lithium sulfur batteries. The reason why we talk about the lithium sulfur batteries is because of the following two reasons. First is the ever increasing demand for high energy battery technologies. And the second is that the conventional lithium ion batteries are approaching their theoretical limit. So it's very essential to explore high energy alternatives beyond lithium ion chemistry. Lithium sulfur batteries 
has multi-electron transfer electrochemistry, and this results in very high theoretical capacity and also very high theoretical energy density. Also, we know that sulfur has the advantages of high abundance and low cost. So, lithium sulfur batteries show the possibility of providing a high energy at a low cost. For those reasons, it has been regarded as one of the most promising next generation battery systems. However, lithium sulfur batteries also have some challenges and problems. First is the insulating nature of sulfur and lithium sulfide, and this will lead to low active material utilization. Second is the high solubility of polysulfide intermediates, and this will cause shuttle effect and very severe active material loss. Third is the volume expansion from sulfur to lithium sulfide, and this will lead to the mechanical cracking of the electrode. And finally, the use of metallic lithium anode will cause the growth of lithium dendrites and lead to safety issues. To address the above problems and challenges, carbon materials have been widely used for the construction of sulfur cathodes because of their advantages of high conductivity, high porosity, and light weight. In our strategy, we realize that sulfur cathode is an integrated structure, and its performance depends on the electron and ion transport efficiency inside it. So this involves the regulation of both microscopic and macroscopic structure, and they correspond to two aspects. First is material design, and second is electrode architecture design. Such design concept can facilitate fast electron and ion transport, trapping the migrating polysulfides, and also enable sufficient sulfur accommodation for a high sulfur loading. In the following, I will give two examples that demonstrate the effectiveness of our strategy. The first example is the branched fibrous carbon nanotube sponge. Here we use carbon nanotubes and the PVP as the precursor to obtain a freestanding sponge structure through a self-assembly and freeze casting method. From the SEM images, we can see that the sponge shows a macroscopic structure of interconnected conductive framework, and the carbon fibers comprise of carbon nanotube bundles, and it can provide abundant channels for boosted electron and ion transport. Sulfur is impregnated into the freestanding sponge through a typical melt diffusion method. And from the SM image and the EDS mapping, we can see that sulfur distributes uniformly on the sponge structure and no agglomerates on the surface can be observed. From the charge-discharge curves, we can see that in comparison with the routine sulfur carbon nanotube cathode, the sponge-based sulfur cathode shows both improved specific capacity and also cycling stability. It also shows good read capability at high current densities and also long-term stable cycle life over 300 cycles. The second example is about the binary graphene-based cathode structure. Here we use two kinds of graphene. First is nitrogen-doped graphene. And in this case, the high electronegativity of nitrogen could enable strong chemical adsorption of polysulfides, and this will improve the reversibility of sulfur cathode. Second is the highly porous graphene. It shows both high conductivity and high porosity to enable fast electron transport and also results in improved sulfur loading and high error capacity. 
from the SEM image, we can see that the nitrogen doped graphene shows a ultra thin crumpled sheet structure. And from the XPS results, we can see that the majority of nitrogen exists in the form of pyridinic and peronic nitrogen, which is very beneficial for the chemical adsorption of polysulfides. The highly porous graphene shows a specific surface area of 418 and it has a pore volume of 1.82 with very broad pore size distribution, which can provide sufficient space for sulfur accommodation and is beneficial to achieve a high sulfur loading. From the stem image and the corresponding elemental mapping, we can observe homogeneous sulfur distribution on the graphene sheets. From the CV profiles, we can see that the sulfur binary graphene composite cathode shows very high reversibility. And from the charge discharge curves, we can see that the cathode shows very stable charge and discharge plateaus. The composite cathode also shows very good cycling stability with a very low capacity decay rate and particularly it can maintain a high area capacity of 6.6 .6 mAh per square centimeter after 300 cycles and those promising electrochemical results can be attributed to the microscopic and macroscopic design of the composite cathode. To make a short conclusion, first we propose that high performance sulfur cathode necessitates microscopic and macroscopic coupled design. And the second is the rational design of carbon shows remarkable advantages in constructing sulfur cathode with high capacity and good cycling stability. And finally, carbon based integral structural design can enable sulfur cathode with high sulfur loading and also high air capacity, which is very promising for practical applications. Thank you very much for your attention. You are very welcome to have questions and comments. Hello everyone, my name is Vladimir Pimenov and I am third year PhD student in Laboratory Shotgun of University of Montpellier. And today I'm going to present results of my work uh, and my presentation called There is plenty of surprises at the bottom. Uh, dynamic instability of individual carbon nanotube growth revealed by MCT optical imaging. Uh, general motivation of this work is to shed light on uh, growth kinetic of individual carbon nanotubes. And from uh, applied point of view, it's important in order to develop uh, chirality selective uh, growth methods based on kinetic selectivity. And from applied point of view, from fundamental point of view, it's well known that uh, growth rate of three and two dimensional crystal depends on uh, their crystal edge or face. And in first approach, carbon nanotubes is nothing but one dimensional crystals with circular edge. And this raised several questions like, what does the edge structure during the growth or possible edge structure? How does it depend on nanotube chirality or catalyst particle? And how does it govern the growth rate? Till now, several approaches were proposed to answer these questions. First of all, was proposed by Marchand uh, and his colleagues, and they used in situ field emission microscopy and uh, evidenced uh, constant growth rates with several, with several accidents. Uh, another approach uh, based on in situ Raman was developed by a group of uh, Benjamin Riyama in the United States and Vincent Jordan in France, and they uh, measured growth kinetics as uh, derivative of nanotube, uh, of nanotube uh, G band area. Uh, this method allowed to measure nanotube kinetics, uh, which can be described by auto, auto decaying process, which can be the evidence uh, of uh, catalyst deactivation. One of the most recent uh, methods was developed by a group of Shigeo Moriyama. They put uh, isotope labels on the nanotubes during their growth 
uh, by diluting ethanol, which was used as a carbon precursor with ethanol containing uh, isotopes carbon 13 in particular moments of time. And after synthesis, they determined the position of these labels using Raman. And distance between this position allowed them to access uh, non-native growth uh, kinetics. Uh, in our turn, we use a method which was developed by the group of Lipper and Finney in Ottawa and Kai Fui Liu in, in the University of Berkeley. And uh, it based on strong uh, optical anisotropy of carbon nanotube, which allowed to separate their signal from, uh, from the background. We use supercontinuum or white uh, laser to excite all nanotubes uh, in the visible spectra and to suppress the scattered the light uh, reflected by the substrate, we use two cross polarizers. Weak signal of nanotube is further amplified by hamadinium or by interferential coupling with, uh, uh, with reflected light, uh, which uh, fr from where the name of the technique is hamadine polarization microscopy. And it's allow it allows at the same time to make uh, to, to measure nanotube optical spectra or, uh, or make the images of them as shown here and there. Uh, we applied this technique uh, to make a video of nanotubes drawn in real conditions, uh, such as atmospheric pressure and on substrate. And in substrate, we used uh, monocrystalline ST cut quartz because it, uh, it has an advantage of uh, polarizing nanotube growth along particular directions. And we put the sample in this way so it, uh, it's uh, nanotube grown uh, at the angle of 45 degree, degrees between two cross polarizers. Uh, the video we obtain with this with this uh, technique you can see here, and you can see that energy grows uh, horizontally aligned from this catalyst line. One of the important stage of of the treatment of the video is shade correction, and here it was made by subtraction of uh, initial image from entire stack of the uh, of uh, video frames. And uh, we developed another approach, which uh, based on subtraction of the frame taken several seconds before, and we call it differential video. Here, its uh, delay time is 10 seconds. Uh, this method has several advantages, uh, one of which is uh, evidence of evolutions. Uh, dark, uh, dark segments correspond to increase of absorption, while bright, con uh, bright contrast corresponds to, to decrease of absorption. And the size of the segments itself corresponds to nanotube growth rate, which is, uh, which is important. Uh, by comparison of our videos with IFM images, we, we, we found out that uh, this method allowed to detect up to 95% of, uh, of grown nanotubes. And using ACM in the mode of uh, weak uh, semiconducting tubes contrast, we, we managed to determine metallicity of nanotube in comparison of SAM and, uh, and the videos. And now I'm going to present you the results. Uh, first case, uh, which we observed in, in almost uh, half uh, of, uh, of cases, it's constant growth rate. You can see kinetic curves here, and you can see that tubes grow linear until abrupt, uh, abrupt stop. Uh, we found no difference between uh, in growth rate and lifetime between metallic and semiconducting tubes in contrast with uh, previously reported results. But it can be the result that we use different conditions, for example, iron as, as uh, catalyst and ethanol as precursor. Uh, we also evidenced uh, anti-correlation of lifetime and growth rates, uh, which can be expanded with temperature. So with increase of temperature, growth rate tends to increase while lifetime, li lifetime tends to decrease. Another, uh, another case we evidence is the stochastic switches of growth rate without uh, change of chirality and with change of chirality uh, based on comparison of video of uh, Raman features along the tube and of SCM. Uh, here you can see uh, the kinetic curves of both of these cases. Uh, you can see that uh, both and uh, with and without chirality change uh, switches between thin growth rates is out, are abrupt from one constant growth rate to another one. We try to, f to search for correlation between uh, growth rate before and after change of chirality, and we uh, fi find some similarity factor uh, about 1.7 for both increase of growth rate and decrease of growth rate. Uh, 
is it, and this similarity factor does not depend on temperature or pressure and even more strikingly interesting results that the same similarity factor was reported by Kayana and his colleagues for uh, completely different uh, growth growth conditions. Uh, also, our Raman analysis allowed us to, to determine safely around 41 nanotubes to chirality 11.8, and we found out that even at the, at the scale of uh, single chirality, growth rate is not monomodal, in complete contrast with previously, uh, with, with existing models. And uh, the last but not least case with evidence are as uh, stochastic switches between growth and shrinkage. Uh, it's uh, manifest as a change of the direction of movement of the segment along with change of, uh, of its contrast. Here you can see the, the kinetic curves of, of uh, this uh, kind of events. And it's important to, to notice that shrinkage proceeds by carbon etching at the face with a catalyst uh, that is by catalytic etching. And also pores can emerge between two steps of, of growth or between growth and etching. And even some nanotubes demonstrate multiple stochastic switches between growth, shrinkage, and regrowth. So now I would like to pass to possible to explanation of possible mechanism of such behavior. Uh, different growth rates and changes of growth rates without change of chirality can be explained by existence of several stable configuration of nanotube edge, for example, more armchair-like and more zigzag-like uh, with different, uh, which, uh, which uh, influence growth rate differently. Uh, but to prove this theory, more uh, modeling will be, will be needed, more, more modeling is required. Uh, however, on the other hand, uh, this behavior changes of, uh, of the edge structure cannot explain presence of etching. It, uh, it should lie at, uh, uh, at the chemical potential faced by the nanotube. Uh, one of the possible explanations is existence of different phase of the catalyst, for example, metallic one more active and uh, carbide one less active. Uh, which is also possible, but uh, to prove this theory, more TM uh, experiments and realistic conditions uh, are required as well. And in any case, it's necessary to rethink uh, current uh, carbon nanotubes uh, growth models. I would like to thank my team and uh, my colleagues for possibility to, to make this, uh, this work. And here is a summary, but I, would, I won't uh, read it. I will leave it for, for you. Thank you for your attention. Hello, everyone. I would like to thank the organizer for this very nice webinar and for inviting me to present a part of my work today about Raman spectroscopy of flattened carbon nanotubes. If I tell you carbon nanotubes, you will most likely think about something like that, a cylinder. However, in certain conditions, the cylindrical shape may be unstable and tubes can pref prefer to adopt a flattened geometry. One way to obtain flat flattened carbon nanotubes is by extracting the tubes one from each other from multiple carbon nanotubes. In doing such, you can end with some tubes large enough to self-collapse. We did this by sonication in solution. Here, a transmission electron microscopy image of the solution after sonication. We can distinguish two kinds of objects. First, some multiple carbon nanotubes as shown by the blue arrows. They typically possess an inner diameter smaller than 4 nanometers and an important number of walls. Then, the orange arrows are emphasizing objects having a smaller number of tubes and much wider than the multiple carbon nanotubes, typically with a width higher than 5 nanometers. Those are flattened, or flattened carbon nanotubes. The tube shown here by the red arrow is quite interesting. It's a cylindrical one on one side and a, and a collapse on the other side. To be sure that it's really flatter, flattening and, the, and not unzipping of the tubes, which is happening, we compared the widths on both sides. If you collapse the cylinder into a ribbon, 
the width of the ribbon should be p over 2 multiplied by the diameter of the initial cylinder. This is what we found here. We then deposit a drop of the solution on a silicon wafer to do at atomic force microscopy and uh, Raman spectroscopy. Those two machines were completely independent, but we managed to find the same zone. Here, the topographic AFM image. We see elongated objects, which are carbon nanotubes, either cylindrical or flattened. Here, a Raman mapping of the same zone. On this image, a Raman spectrum has been taken on each pixel, and the color intensity of the pixel is adjusted according to the given intensity. As you, as you can see, those two images are perfectly overlapping. This means that we can in principle attribute the Raman spectrum of each single object. Then we focus on a zone having a low density of nanotubes. Here's the zone. It contains six elongated objects. Among, among them, one is for example flattened, at least. In fact, a single wall flattened nanotubes can be seen as a bilayer graphene nanoribbons, which is closed on each border by two longitudinal cavities. We can clearly see on the AFM images and on the prof profile line the presence of those cavities. Actually, by measuring the height value of the six objects, it's possible to sort them in two categories, cylindrical or flattened. We have here three cylindrical tubes and three flattened tubes. As I was telling you just before, we were able to attribute the spectrum uh, of those single objects. We have then a direct comparison between the Raman response of cylindrical versus flattened tubes. I will actually show you that those spectra are very different. And here the spectra, normalized over the G-band. A first difference that I won't have time to discuss is the two dimension shapes and intensities. A second is the absence or quasi absence of a D band in the case of isolated cylindrical carbon nanotubes, while, while flattened tubes present an intense and narrow D band. The absence of D band in cylindrical tubes is telling us something really interesting here. It's saying that there is almost no structural defects in the cylindrical tubes and in the flattened tubes as well. In fact, both cylindrical and flattened tubes come from the same solution. They undergo the exact same chemical and physical treatment. As a result, all objects are expected to present the same structural defect density. But then, if this band uh, present only on flattened tubes is not induced by, by structural defects, where is, where is it coming from? We first verified that this band can be called a D-band. What I mean is that this band is coming from the same physics than for the classical D-band in graphenic material. Indeed, the band we measured is dispersive. This validates its origin from an ITO branch near the cap point. The question then is why such a D-band? Among the abundant literature on the subject, we found one paper from Eklund's group showing experimentally that the presence of a fold on a graphene sheet can activate a D-band. In flattened carbon nanotubes, the cavities are formed by folding of graphene sheet. So we are now at the guilty. The cavities are responsible for the huge and narrow D-band in flattened nanotubes. Next question, what is the mechanism behind the D-band activation? So quick reminder, in graphenic materials, the D-bands the D-band comes from a double resonance effect. First, a photon is absorbed, what sends a charge to an excited state. A first inelastic scattering event involving a phonon sends a charge to a second state. To be able to recombine, a second scattering event, an elastic one, that time, is needed. So, an elastic backscattering is needed. Then, why does this backscattering event occur with cavities? We proposed three hypotheses for that. The first hypothesis, sorry, the first hypothesis involves the hybridization change near the cavity. 
it is known that the curvature induces a partial hybridization change. For example, here the red arrow on the scheme uh, shows the presence of a line of partial sp2 sp3 hybridization in between two sp2 zones. This line com comes necessarily with an energy barrier able to backscatter a charge. The second hypothesis involves the same kind of energy barrier near the cavities, but instead of coming from the hybridization change, it comes from the change of stacking correlation in between the central zone and the cavities. Finally, the charge could simply follow the cavity by turning around the fold uh, to recombine with the charge above. We were not able to elucidate which of those mechanisms uh, have, the, have a major contribution to the signal, but regardless, they all come from the fold. Finally, some colleagues did some simulation using the Plaxec uh, approximation. They found that, that the collapse of a tube provoked a new band near the Liban region. Qualitatively, when looking at the vibration associated, it's possible to recognize the breathing-like mode of the carbon hexagons associated to the D-band in graphene. To conclude, I show you today that in flattened carbon nanotubes, the D-band is inherent to the geometry of the object. So, the D-band cannot be used for structural defect density measurement in flattened carbon nanotubes. Then, during my whole presentation, I have been careful to use the expression structural defect. In a sense, by doing that, I adopt a chemist's point of view. Indeed, for a chemist, defect is about functionalization involving sp3 carbon or vacancies, for example. On the other hand, a physicist would be more general in its definition. For them, a defect is a symmetry breaking. Even if contrary to an age, a cavity keeps the framework continuity, it's a symmetry breaker. So we could almost say that our previous conclusion is trivial. Finally, what I show you today is general usually used as a tool to quantify defect density in graphenic structure, the D-band cannot be used as such in the presence of graphene fold. To illustrate this, I can take the example of graphene wrinkles. We can clearly see here the contribution of the wrinkle to the D-band. A second example could be the case of graphite polyhedral crystals. Here, a D-band is visible only on the zones where a curvature change is present. It will, not, it will notably be wonderful to be able to dissociate the contribution of structural distortion and chemistry like defects. Here, for, is, for instance, a graphene sheet coming from a surfactant free graphene dispersion in water. You can see the fold and on the spectrum the D-band. Finally, it's possible that, that some materials having structural distortion and where poor carbon organization was concluded on a Raman basis have to be revisited. I now want to thank all my colleagues which participate to this work and I want to thank the founders as well. Thank you very much for your attention. Please feel free to ask me questions at the end of this session or by email. Thank you very much. And thanks to all the speakers for some really excellent talks. Now is the time for an open question and answer session. The way this will work is you can write your questions into the chat in Zoom. Um, and you can also um, put your hand up and then uh, we'll call on you to unmute yourself. Um, I've put up here the names of the different speakers in order and the name of their talks to, um, so that you can direct your questions um, at the speaker that you want to answer. So I think we've already got um, one question here. Can I get a copy of the recording? Yes, at the... Um, this will be put on to YouTube after this, and uh, it will be accessible from the Carbon webinar uh, website, which you can find in the Australian Carbon 
uh, society's website. So, and I think we have someone who wants to have a, a question as well there. Ah, oh, yes. So we have a question for Dr. Fang. Is a nanoporous graphene a graphene with holes? Okay, should I answer the question now? Yep. Um, yeah, um, actually the nanoporous, we mean um, we can characterize from the uh, nitrogen absorption and we can find the pore size. They can be classified into micropores, mesopores, and macropores. And the size can range from um, um, less than one nanometer to and up to about 100 nanometer. And within those size, so we call those graphene nanoporous graphene. So is it okay to answer the question? Thank you. Okay. Great. Excellent. So the next question is for Fajana. So thanks for your talk. How do you define the 1C for few layer graphene? Let's say page nine, based on one hour charging or theoretical capacity. It seems you don't have a fixed theoretical capacity for this carbon. Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, you're right that we don't have a fixed capacity, theoretical capacity. So what we did, we cycled the sample at a very slow rate, like very small current. And for that smallest current that we can apply, we recorded how much time it took for the half cycle to complete. And it came out to be five hours. So we assume that uh, this is like three by five rate. And according to that, we decided the C rate and other fancy or whatever. Great, thank you. I think we have um, Mark Wanchu who has his hand up. So um, you can now unmute yourself and ask a question. Oh, right, one second. Okay, I think you can unmute yourself now, sorry. Okay. Sorry, I think you're still muted, but I think you should be able to unmute yourself now. There we go. Okay, so I, I said that, uh, I, I'm sorry, the question is to, for the two ladies, not for the guys, um, again. Um, it's a general question about, uh, both have uh, work on, on lithium batteries, and it's, and um, I wanna, I, I have been told that lithium might be a problem, with the source, lithium source in the future, and also I've been told the contrary. So do you have an idea about the reality of that? Is it, do we have to worry about the lithium supply? And then we have to, we should go to other cation, cation or other, uh, other um, uh, solutions than lithium? Or don't we have to worry about that? Okay, should, uh, should I ask the question first? Yeah. Uh, you can just go for it, I think. Yeah, okay. So, so um thank you for your question. So you are ask, you're so you're asking about the supply of the lithium source for lithium batteries, right? Um yes, actually um on one hand, this is a concern because the source of lithium, especially compared with like the sodium, is is much lower. Yeah, this is the fact. So this is the reason why now sodium ion batteries and also sodium mantle batteries is attracting increasing attention. But on the other hand, um, from the performance wise, um, the performance of lithium batteries, including their NS density. So they are, they are they still have very overwhelming advantages over the sodium based batteries. So that's why um, now um, in our electrochemical energy storage research 
So um, we are trying to develop bell funds. So um, we are now still using the lithium ion batteries as the dominant one. And we are also developing sodium ion batteries as the alternative. So, um, so in this way, so we can um, try to satisfy the future applications for um, maybe Maybe it'd be uh, maybe one day um, we all um, have a short in the theme supply, but we still have alternatives. But currently, the the theme and batteries they are still dominant. Mm, okay, thanks. Okay. Um, do you have anything to add for Jana, or is that all good? No, well, I think it's all that we can answer to this question. Thanks. All right, so we have a question for Dr. Pimenov. So can your technique be used for studying nanotube alignment embedded in a matrix? Uh, so <clears throat> if I'm correct, uh, embed to matrix means that it's addition of carbon nanotubes into some kind of compound like to some glass or some some material. Uh, in this case, uh, answer I would say yes and no uh, because we have pretty small area of like focal zone, and the system is very sensitive. We can study these uh, systems uh, with. Well, it will be a complex study, so in general it's possible, but it will be necessary to make several images uh, through the through the matrix and also it will need to make uh, an investigation of this uh, sample under different angles because the highest intensity highest contrast have uh, the nanotubes aligned at 45 degrees between two cross polarizers so that part of tubes which will uh, align uh, along the axis of uh, polarizers so won't be seen at all so basically it's possible, but it will be slightly more complex uh, system, uh, slightly more complex uh, investigation than uh, the one I shown. But yeah, I would say with, with necessary desire and necessary rigor, it's possible. Great, thank you very much. Um, so the second, the other question um, for Dr. Show is is there any correlation between nanotube chirality and flattening phenomena? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So thank you very much for the question. It's quite uh, an interesting question, actually. So um, the the flattening stability is due to the to the Inter, uh, attractive interaction in the middle part, right? Uh, so it's no, uh, there is uh, no uh, the correlation between the flattening and the chirality of the tube is quite uh, neglectable. So if you take a single wall carbon on the tubes, the limit uh, it, you will see then above a diameter of around five nanometers, almost uh, regardless of chirality, the nanotube will be more stable, flattened. Than, uh, than cylindrical. So I have great answers, thank you both. I actually have an extension of that question. Um, you mentioned in one of your hypotheses for how the D mode gets activated, that there is some sort of um, alignment between the, the different layers. And I wonder if you could test that by checking the different chiralities of the uh, nanotubes, maybe in a simulation. If you tried different chiralities, you could see whether the, um, whether the misalignment angles between the different layers is contributing to, the, to that defect band. Uh, indeed, yes, it's, it may be something, uh, uh, I don't know much about the simulation part. It's, I, I didn't do did that, so I'm not very sure what I would say is correct, but. Uh, yes, um, uh, I guess in principle it would be possible. Uh, the only we did some variation of the chirality, but we just I think verified and 
it was uh, activated in one case and not activated in the other case, but not due to correlation, just due to the zigzag or armchair ball, which is the uh, same rules than for the graphene ages. Mm -hmm. But this uh, testing the, um, the interaction between both uh, uh, layers could, uh, would be very interesting, yes. Great. All right, well, I think um, I'm going to have to uh, stop the quick Q&As, but don't worry if you still have a question because there'll be an opportunity um, to, to talk more casually. Uh, before that, I just wanted to promote the talk for next week. So the talk next week will actually be the 2021 Graphen Lecture given by Dr. Ryan Paul, and he'll be going through the history of synthetic graphite, which will be a very interesting talk. So I recommend you signing up for that on the website. Um, it should uh, be a, a, an interesting historical, but also an, an industrially focused talk as well um, with his experience both in uh, academia and in industry. I also wanted to tell you that there's another opportunity for early career researchers to engage. Um, we're going to be having a poster session on the 3rd of November. You can uh, see information there on the website, sign up with just a title at the moment. And then on the 3rd of November, we will have, be having a live opportunity for you to uh, present posters, um, potentially using um, uh, Zoom, or we, we might even um, get away with using uh, this gather town.